very excited today that God still is in the business of changing people's lives. God is still making the crooked ways of life straight. God is making the impossibilities of life possible. God is making the unbearabilities of life bearable. And God is still bringing light where there is darkness. Did you know that darkness cannot break light? It's not designed for that. You cannot measure darkness as you can measure light. And where there is darkness, it's only because there is a lack of light. And so we understand today that God has given us a highway. Yes, amen. Pastor Stephen just read it in the scriptures. There is a highway. You've heard the expression, <coughs> my way or the highway. <coughs> Well, if your way was the highway, I'd take it. So I consider mine to be the highway, you're the low way. Sorry. And so we, we come to that place in life where we have to make choices. I heard a prayer request in the media center during our time of prayer before we came to the platform this morning. The prayer request was to pray for a family who over this past weekend or a few days ago or yesterday, whenever it was, Friday, a 21-year-old boy, never been in trouble before, made one bad choice. His first bad choice and decision of life caused him to kill somebody else this weekend in a car wreck, head-on collision on 321. How many know that one bad choice one deviation from the right way can be very costly. I wish that man within his own capacity was able to design his own way that would be beneficial for all. But man being flawed fundamentally cannot build a road that can benefit all of humanity. He's not designed and capable to do that. Otherwise, he'd be God himself. But the Bible tells us here that God has built a highway. Not a low way, but a crooked way. A straight and narrow way. That is a highway that is traversable. It is a highway that you can really live by. A highway is designed to bring you somewhere. Right. Roads are built for the purpose of getting you somewhere where you're not there yet. Yes. Amen. Amen. This. I have two assistant preachers this morning behind me. And they're already aiding me in my sermon. <laughs> and that's all right. That's, keep it up, boys. It, it, it'll help. God knows I need all the help I can get. Now listen closely. When God builds a road, it's to get you from point A to point B. It's to get you somewhere. To go somewhere. Heading somewhere. As Pastor just whispered in my ear. That means you're leaving somewhere. You're going from one place to another place. Now the Bible says that there's a way that seemeth right unto man. The way that we plan for ourselves seems to be the right way. But the Bible says the ends of those ways are the ways of death. You cannot design for yourself a life of purpose and a purposeful life that can supersede what God designs and purposes for your life. Amen. You cannot live better than on the highway of God. Amen. There is no way that you can plan, design, or that you can engineer for your life 
There are no future plans for your life that can be better than what God's plan is for your life. Because the road that we choose is filled with potholes. The roads that we choose are inferior. The roads that we choose are inundated and filled with dangerous obstacles, unsurmountable problems. And that's why so many people give up, give in, and surrender all hope, surrender their faith, surrender their dreams. They surrender their aspirations in life. Because the road that you plan for yourself is inferior. And in no time flat, the people you thought could help you are the ones that led you to destruction. The roads that we plan for ourselves are some that have been influenced by others in our life, whether philosophically, in terms of ideologies, in terms of insights. And it's good to receive from other people. As long as they add to your life, that is on the highway of life, the highway of holiness that Jesus spoke about and God speaks about here. And I want to, as I mentioned to about before about my pulpit robe that I wear once a month. I told my wife this morning in, in the media center, I said, I like my robe. I like it. It feels good on. And I wear it once a month because the first day of, the first Sunday of the month typically is dedicated also to a patriotic insight. Knowing that the Black Robe Regiment, the preachers of the day, knew that God had a divine highway for this new nation called America to walk on. That God had a plan for this nation. That it was going to be a distinct, separate and best highway that all of mankind could have possibly dreamed of. Amen. And they sought the Lord. They prayed. The founding fathers of our nation knew how dependent that they were upon God's provision and His leading and His inspiration and His divine guidance. It, Benjamin Franklin made it very clear when they got to an impasse there in that Hall of Independence, Independence Hall there in Philadelphia, when they argued to the point of dismissing each other and some walking out. He stood up, big boisterous man, he said, hold it everybody, stop, hold it! Confusion will lead us no way, nowhere. And the reason why we are confused is because we are selfishly motivated here today. We're looking for our way. We're looking for what we want. And Benjamin Franklin, who was not necessarily a religious man, he was not necessarily a dedicated Christian. He knew. He knew in his mind and in his heart I may not be the most righteous and holy person around. I may not wear the clerical robe. I may not be in a pulpit. But I'm not that stupid. I wasn't born yesterday. I know this. That unless we get God to lead us and guide us. We will do no better than the builders of the Tower of Babel. We will continue in confusion. And we will destroy ourselves before we even begin. He said I suggest that we leave this place and go a few blocks down the road and get into that church and begin to seek God and seek His will, His way, His highway for this new nation. And they did that. In a matter of days, they came back and they gave us the Declaration of Independence. They gave us the Constitution of the United States of America. There's a way that seems right to man, but man is flawed because of his selfishness. 
He's flawed because it's numero uno, number one here, no numero uno. Number one, him. That's what he wants for himself. How can I benefit from this? Not how others can benefit. How I can benefit. But God said there's a highway. And that's why we wear the black robe or the, shall we say, the pulpit robe once a month because we want to let America know and let our community know that we here at Calvary Community Church believe in the divine appointment and the divine establishment of this nation. We believe that this nation is still under covenant with God and that God's hand is still upon this nation. And while we're talking about that, by the way, and I don't want to spend too much time on that, at, at, at some point in my message, I'll get to my message. We are in an election year here in America. And I don't know how you view the Democrat, uh, the Democrat uh, uh, candidates and also the Republican candidates as they come together and they have these platforms and debates. And I find it amusing. And then I, sometimes I feel like I want to cry. Uh, not tears of joy. Sometimes I want to just hit somebody. We, we, I, sometimes I look for the Board of Education. There are people in this nation that are bent on destroying this nation. And I see the debates. I hear them speaking. And I find it amusing in this sense. What man proposes, God disposes. That's in the scripture. What man plans, God disposes. God annuls completely. And then I find it quite interesting, very insightful, how I see that God is moving the checkerboard, all right? And the checker is on the checkerboard, the chest, if you want to, the chest again. How God is moving different ones. How this year, all the commentators have all agreed that we who have predicted were all wrong. What we have anticipated, we have completely missed. In other words, it yet remains that it's unpredictable what's going to happen this fall. It's unpredictable. But I predict Oh, oh, don't tell me you're going to predict who the next president is. No, I am predicting that God is going to elect the next president. I said God is going to elect the next president. Because I see God manipulating here. I'm seeing God at work. And I'm seeing those who have ill intent imploding. Oh, they may have a few to support their ideologies. We have one that is actually declaring himself openly a Democrat socialist. And he's ready to give away the whole store. We have so many who are trying to destroy America. But I'm here to encourage you also this morning as I get into my message. America is under covenant relationship with God. In 1604, 1605, when Reverend Hunt came with three little boats, when he landed in a place called Virginia Beach, They were like the politicians we see today. They were arguing on those boats. Did you know that? They were fussing and arguing, gossiping. <coughs> they were at each other's throats. And you know what he said? We're not getting off of these boats. He said, we're not going to soil this new land with this spirit. We're not leaving the seas until we get right with God. 
And they took them days upon days of fasting and praying on those little boats to help them. And when they got to a place where they could love each other and understand that they were here under the divine guidance of Almighty God, then they came on shore. And the very first thing that they did, thank you very much, is that they knelt on the seashore. And they prayed. They planted a cross right there at Virginia Beach. There's still the spot there today. And they had communion. And they said, we dedicate this land to Almighty God. Almost a hundred years prior to that, when Menendez came from Spain to a place called St. Augustine in Florida, back in 1530s, somewhere in that area, I believe it was, when he landed, the priest that came with him had everybody kneel down, and they planted a cross. That cross is still there today. It soars tens of feet into the sky. Huge cross at the, at the fountain there. And they knelt, they prayed, and they had communion. And they said, we dedicate this land to Almighty God. Amen. This land, back from the 1500s and 1600s, was dedicated to God in covenant relationship with Him. And today, I declare America still in covenant relationship with God. And I believe that God still has his hand on America. And this nation will rise again. And God's going to raise missionaries and evangelists in this last day in America. Never before seen as we're going to see here in America in the days to come. Look for it. Because his Holy Spirit will be poured out upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy, Joel said. And Peter confirmed it. He said, upon my handmaidens, upon my servants, I will pour out of my spirit. And they shall speak the word. They will preach the word. They will prophesy the word. And they will be the mouthpiece of God. And I believe this nation, once again, will rise to the very summit of the highest mountains of this world. And be again the city, a shining city, on a hill built by by God, not by man. Give the Lord a good pass. Now, to my message. I've got to do this. In Isaiah 35, let's go back to that, and I have very brief time. What I'm talking about, I broke into a new series of messages last Sunday morning, and it's the joy of the Lord, the people's strength. And I shared with you the message last Sunday morning out of John chapter 15. That Jesus said, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy may be in you, may remain in you, and that your joy might be full. <clears throat> what we're trying to establish is a definition of what the joy of the Lord is. What, is, what defines his joy? What, what, what does that look like? Where does it come from? How is it birthed? Because in Nehemiah 8.10, it said, Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord shall be your strength. You need strength to live for God. You need intestinal fortitude. You need tenacious faith. You need a living hope. You need the divine love of God in your heart in order to succeed in living for God. You need a joy, what Peter called unspeakable, indescribable, infathomable, and filled with glory and joy, yes. filled yes. with glory. Yes. For you to succeed, 
The joy of the Lord. Jesus said, I'm preaching these things. I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to explain to you these things so that my joy, what I have, you can have too. No matter where your walk is with God right now, I pray that you come after this service into that place with God that you have His joy in your heart. And that your joy will be filled. And so last Sunday, I broke it down. And, and just in quick recap, basically what Jesus was saying, three or four verses prior to verse 11 in John 15, <clears throat> he said, I love my father and my father loves me. I do those things that please my father. I obey my father's commandments. My father and I have an intimate relationship. I walk with my father. I talk with my father. My father walks and talks with me. We have a relationship that brought me a joy that sustains me in ministry. It sustains my life. And you, he was saying, are going to need the same joy that I have. And you must receive my joy. And so I explained to the folks last Sunday that the joy that Jesus had in his life that sustained him, upheld him, su supported him, lifted him up, and preserved him was the joy of having an intimate relationship and being in love with God Almighty. Hallelujah. It's a principle of life. People who are in love are literally invincible impregnable you can't hurt people that are in love when you're in love honey no they just bounces off of you nothing bothers you you know why because that love that you have has birthed such a powerful hope such a powerful faith that nothing disrupts that it gives you such a stamina, this joy. And the church in America needs the joy of the Lord again. And where there is no joy is because there is no love. Amen. Where the joy has diminished in the marriage relationship or in the family place, the joy has gone is because love is gone. <clears throat> Jesus' joy was birthed out of the loving relationship he had with his heavenly father. And so Jesus said, I want that joy to be in you. I want you to experience the same joy that I have. But it's not something that I can transfer to you. It's not something I can just impart to you. You have got to get into the same relationship with God the Father as I have. Here's the way. Let me take your hand and lead you. I'll show you how you can now. You don't have to pray to an abstract God. You can call him daddy. You can call him your personal heavenly father. You can call him your own. And you realize that you are a son and a daughter and a child of Almighty God. That should lift your spirit. It should strengthen your heart. It should resolve your faith to no end, my friend, and give you strength unspeakable and full of glory. He didn't just impart it to us. He showed us how to get it. He said, if I have joy and that, that sustains me, it's because... I have that relationship, my love and relationship, and I want to show you, you can have it too. He said, the love that the Father and I have, I want you to have it too. I want you to love God, my Father, and I want you to love me. If you love me, you'll keep my words. And when you keep my words, you'll sh it'll show you that you love me. And if you love me, I'll give you joy, because joy is birthed out of love. Hallelujah to the man of God. Let me go back to verse 10 now. Let me go back to verse 10. Uh, we're in Isaiah 35. In case you forgot, I went out of there so long. <clears throat> the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. With an everlasting joy on their heads. 
Just give me that over there, would you please, for a second? The crown. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. An everlasting joy shall be on their head. In the French version, God crowns us with joy. Yeah, but, but he says an everlasting joy shall be on your head. It, it's not just, let me just get it, uh, J-O-Y. No. An everlasting joy is a crown that never fades away. It is a crown that dignifies you. It's a crown that gives you status. It is a crown that gives you a sense that you are above all of your past and that God has raised you into heavenly places with him. They shall obtain gladness and joy. They shall return with singing and joy shall be upon their head. Literally, he said, I will crown them with joy. <coughs> if you don't have joy, see if you can relocate your crown. See, if you didn't know you had a crown, let's see how that looks like. That just that. Well, that, that looks good. That. Stand up, son. Show them everybody. You people over here can't see it. Look at that. See it? Oh man, yes. this guy right here. Oh! An everlasting joy, an everlasting crown shall be on your head. You see, when you read the Bible, you have to read it. If you read it like a novel, you're not going to get a crown out of that. Have you read that verse before? Did you ever see a crown before? No, you didn't see a crown until I told you about it. <coughs> but that's what the Word of God says. I will put a crown of joy on their heads. It brings you that dignity. It brings you that level of being in the heavens with Him. He says, and never lasting joy. Did you see that? Everybody say, everlasting. See, this one is not going to last forever. <laughs> well, I could have told you that. I think it was four dollars and ninety-five cents over at Party City or something like that. <laughs> not going to last forever. But being from Montreal, I was at one time a British subject until 1967, when Canada uh, founded its own independence from Mother Queen, and then we were just Canada. We still have our picture on our dollar bills and so on. And we have John A. McDonald, which, by the way, was a relative of mine, my ancestry. The first prime minister of Canada, as equal to be with George Washington, was my grandmother's mother. That's my great-grandmother's brother. My great-grandmother's brother was the first prime minister of Canada. So we have his picture. We have other pictures, but mostly the Queen of England is, is on our dollar bill. Now, and all these things are going to perish away, but the joy, the crown that God gives you is a crown of joy that's it's a, it, it's a crown of joy that's everlasting. See, your salvation is not just for today and tomorrow. Your salvation is everlasting. Do you think we're going to deposit our crowns at the gate when we get there? No. no. The joy goes with you. Amen. The peace goes with you. you. Oh, what, 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 the blood goes with you. Yes. You don't drop the blood at the door. 
because he sprinkled his blood on that mercy seat is going to be there forever. The long suffering, the peace that passes understanding, the joy of the Lord shall be your strength. He's going to be with you because it's not something that man fabricated. It's not something that came from a happenstance. I won the lottery, bless God, I'm happy for it. No, because that money will fade away. The Bible says this, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. So what are we saying? Everything you have in this life is going to pass away. Now I'm talking about joy. <clears throat> Why is that important? Because uh, I haven't got time to go on all. I'm on a series, and so just be patient. We're going to take it one chunk at a time. And by the way, uh, <laughs> I spoke to, uh, some, quite often I, I deal with uh, Vivian over here because her and I, uh, we have preaching sessions you know, on the phone from time to time. And last Monday I called her. She said, Pastor, I just wanted to shout last Sunday morning. She said, when you talked about the love, the love, you know, generates or, or love gives birth to joy. And what she came to her mind is the Revelation chapter 2, how the church of Ephesus had lost its first love. When you lose your first love, you're surrendering your crown of joy. You've got to have the love of God in your heart. And we need to get back to the first love. In other words, they were doing everything right. They were the most religious Christians around in Ephesus. They had all their social activities down in terms of benevolence and helping people and so on and so forth. They had all of their religious activities in the church service down just right. I mean, the whole church was really good. And God said in his word, I only have one thing that I need to correct you about that I need to rebuke you about. You've lost your first love. How do you know that there are marriages today, for instance, that they seem quiet on the surface? That they seem fine? Huh? But the effervescence and the joy of the first love is gone. I keep asking Diana, I said, I hope you never get tired of me telling you how much I love you. She said, mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no, I'll never get tired of that. Sometimes I feel like I bother her because I'm always hanging on her, you know, and I'm looking to grab her, you know, hang on her and stuff. And you now she's got four cats to hang on to, which she doesn't need to do that. <laughs> And the four cats, you know, in most times, takes precedence over this cat. And so I, I have to wait until they're out bedded and sleeping, and I get my turn. I can't sit on their lap like they do, but at least I get close, and uh, so on and so forth. And, and sometimes she scratches my back like she does the cat, you know. That's my hand to do. But I keep telling her that how, how grateful I am because God has placed her in my life. And, and so there's, a, there's an effervescence there that stays there. And so what I want to do today, and I'm, I'm only lowering my flaps. You've heard me say it a 